Hello, everybody. This is Norma Levy, New Plaza's president. We're a nonprofit organization. Today, we'll be discussing a fine 1958 noir film called Touch of Evil. It was directed by Orson Welles and stars, in addition to Welles, Charlton Heston and Janet Lee, with a cameo appearance by Marlena Dietrich. And now it's my great pleasure to turn this over to our curator and host, Gary Palmucci. Gary? Thanks very much, Norma. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to this uh, uh, dissection of Orson Welles' great 1958 film, uh, Touch of Evil. Uh, his, his last American film, at least the last one released during his lifetime, and a movie that, as we're going to find out shortly, to those of you who may or may not know, exists in three very distinct uh, iterations, an original cut, uh, a preview version discovered in the mid-70s, and then uh, the version that hopefully will become the definitive one, a, a very, a comp I, I say comp com maybe complex isn't the word, but we're going we're gonna to learn a lot about it today, restoration. Uh, in 1998, which was set to premiere at the Cannes Film Festival that year in 98. And I was fortunate to be at the festival that year. And, and in between uh, various screenings and meetings, I was able to get into the screening of Touch of Evil in, in a large theater that of course was completely filled, awaiting the first public screening of this uh, uh, restoration, which had been underway for, uh, for some time. And Showtime came around and an announcement was made that the uh, screening was canceled because there have been objections uh, raised to the film by Beatrice Wells, Orson Wells' uh, daughter, one of his, one of three daughters that he had, sort of King Lear fashion in his life. Now, of course, Wells had been deceased for 13 years at this point, but particularly in Europe, there's a concept called author's rights, where the descendants of a filmmaker or artist of any kind essentially are, have the final say in the artistic direction of the film. And for some reason, Miss Wells wasn't happy about that and stopped the screening. Things were eventually worked out and it premiered in, in the US several months later. I, I, I got to see it with my son and it's, it's quite a revelation as we're gonna find out today. So and I think this is a movie that is, is, is figured in the lives of everybody in our group here today that I'm very happy to, uh, to be with. So I'm going to uh, introduce, you, uh, introduce you a little bit differently today to two of our participants at once. One of them you know well, our, uh, cinematography expert, Dan Cahill, and also uh, uh, a young lady I just had the, the pleasure of meeting a few minutes ago. Her name is Imogen Sarah Smith, and she is a, a uh, esteemed and very impressive uh, uh, expert on film noir, author, uh, commentary track participant on a number of DVDs, and I, I can particularly recommend one that I uh, saw and read the, her written material on this past year, uh, a, a grade A film noir that I hadn't seen. I, I recommend it called Ride the Pink Horse on the Criterion Co Collection label. So uh, Dan and Imogen, welcome. It's great to be here with you. Um, thank you, Gary. Uh, it is my pleasure and privilege to introduce Ms. Smith. Uh, we collaborated about a year ago on a talk back on Woman on the Run. And now we have her back for an Orson Welles epic um, let me explain why we esteem Imogen so much. She has written a book on film noir called In Lonely, In Lonely Places, Film Noir Beyond the City. She also wrote the book on Buster Keaton, The Persistence of Comedy. Right now, she is working on a biography of Lauren Bacall, which I would love to read. I'm impatient. Um, she, as Gary noted, is a frequent commentator for the Criterion Collection and various Blu-rays, including new ones from Kino Lorber that are coming out now. She teaches film history at NYU and main media workshops. And now I want to put in a plug for a publication that I really admire. It's called Noir City. It's a quarterly online publication. It's a magazine, essentially. This is an annual that they publish. Um, this is this originates from Eddie Muller's Film Noir Foundation, and I am thrilled to announce that Imogen is now the editor in chief of Noir City. So she is a very busy lady, and I welcome her and thank her for giving us some time. I will go dark until I come back for my sequence. Okay, so um, I think at, at, this might be a good time for us. We're, we're going to have a cameo appearance by Max Alvarez. Uh, as, as we often do at this point in the program, 
uh, although we, then we sometimes go on to greater length. But today uh, we're gonna we're gonna have a look at a trailer uh, that Max unearthed on Touch of Evil, which I which I believe dates back to the original release. Max, is that correct? This is correct, Gary. This will be the original trailer for Touch of Evil. And if you're ready, we can I can fire it right up for you. I don't see why not. This was her wedding night. Where was the man she had married? Who were these hoodlums? Hold her legs. Starring this outstanding cast, Charlton Heston, Janet Lee. I could love being corny if my husband would only cooperate. Orson Welles, co-starring Joseph Kalea, Akim Tamirov, with guest stars Marlena Dietrich, Zsa, Zsa Gabor. What are you trying to do? We're trying to strap you in the electric chair, boy. Only the offbeat, original, creative powers of Orson Welles could bring you so suspenseful, so gripping, so different a drama of love threatened by vengeance. Mike may be spoiling some of your... Mike? My husband, yeah. And if you're trying to scare me into calling him off, let me tell you something, Mr. Grandy. I may be scared, but he won't be. Of a struggle between titans. You framed that boy. Framed him! Of a manhunt like nothing you've ever experienced. A cop now. I'm a husband. What did you do with her? Where is my wife? My wife! Okay, well, once again, Imogen, uh, welcome. I, I, I don't know if I've ever seen that trailer before, and I was expecting something a little more along the lines of an exploitation type trailer, given the, the producer, Albert Zugsmith's background. That seemed pretty, explo pretty exploitation trailer to me, I have to say. I was thinking they made a, did a pretty good job of making it look trashy and sensational, um, which as you say, was sort of Zugsmith's specialty. And yet, you saw some of the most dynamic shots in the picture as well. You know, the the uh, the impact of the exploding car, the fight in the bar, the uh, confrontations between Wells and 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 Charlton Heston. It seemed like it was they managed to get the fact that this is a little something a little different than your typical uh, ten day uh, wonder or something. You know, that uh, a producer like that was famous for. But well, as we said earlier, and we'll, we'll get into this shortly. There's at least three different iterations of this picture and its history, but Tell us a little bit, where, where was Orson Welles in 1958? He had been away for about a decade, right, in, in Europe? Yes, so Welles at this point, it was about 10 years since he had directed a film in Hollywood. That would have been Macbeth, which he made for Republic Pictures in 1948. He had made Othello and uh, Mr. Arcaden or The Confidential Report in Europe, but he's basically persona non grata in Hollywood. I mean, he was still getting acting roles, which he would take in order to finance his own filmmaking, but he had really worn out his welcome as a director just because of his, you know, not working well within the studio system, it being too much of a maverick. So he had come back and he had acted in this film called Man in the Shadow which was produced by Zug Smith. It's kind of a low budget sort of noir Western. Interestingly, with some similar themes to Touch of Evil, um, it's, it also has a kind of honorable lawman who ends up being framed by various corrupt forces. It deals with racism against Mexican migrant workers. Welds plays a kind of, he plays the heavy 
the owner of this ranch. Anyway, it's it's a little bit like maybe what Touch of Evil could have been had it not been directed by Wells. And after he made this film, Zug Smith gave him this script, um, which he had. It was based on a novel called Badge of Evil um, by Whit Masterson, which is actually the pen name of two men named Robert Wade and Bill Miller, who wrote more than 30 Western novels together. Um, the book is set in San Diego. It's not set on the Mexican border. The sort of hero is not Mexican. There are a number of differences, but um, Universal already had this script adaptation by a man named Paul Monash. He gave it to Wells, asking him to play the role of Quinlan. Wells always said that he thought it was a terrible script, but that he felt he couldn't afford to not take this part. Now, there are, as with almost everything involving Wells, there's a lot of kind of different variations and what the truth is often kind of elusive. But what seems like the most uh, believable story of how Wells wound up directing is that the studio approached Charles and Heston and asked him to star. And he asked who was directing the film. And they said, well, we don't know yet, but we have Wells playing the heavy. And Heston said, well, how about having Wells direct? Um, and there's a wonderful passage. He wrote about this, Heston, in his diaries. And he says, it was as if I had suggested my mother direct the movie. You know, like that's how the, how shocked the studio was by this suggestion. But anyway, eventually Heston did support Wells as a director. Wells directed and rewrote the script for no fee. He only received payment as an actor on this film. And he was hoping that Touch of Evil would be a success and this would reestablish him in Hollywood, which did not happen. So no. we'll, well get he was, there. He was very busy at that time, around 1958. He was certainly working very hard that year. He was in The Long Hot Summer with Paul Newman and Joanne Woodward. And there's some interesting things you can find, I think, on YouTube. A very fascinating 30-minute TV show, I'm sure you've seen it, called The Fountain of Youth that he directed for Lucille Ball's company, Desi Lou. And then he was famously on the I Love Lucy show and what's, what's actually a pretty amusing episode where he plays himself and sending up all his, you know, caricatured uh, ego and so forth. Uh, so he's he's certainly very busy at this time. Now, the picture was shot mostly in Venice, California. Is that correct? Yes. Wells supposedly wanted to shoot it in Tijuana. And again, there are sort of uh, conflicting explanations of why he wasn't able to do that. Um, he said the Mexican government didn't support it. Uh, Heston said the studio wanted to keep Wells close by where they could keep an eye on him. But anyway, so the Los Robles is in fact Venice, California. Um, other parts, the the motel section is filmed in Palmdale. It was all, mostly filmed on location. And the shoot seems to have been a really happy experience. The studio did largely leave him alone. Everyone involved in this in the film seems to have, you know, said it was it was you know, there was this incredible sense of excitement and energy. And, you know, they all knew they were making something that was really extraordinary. And Wells was, you know, coming up with all these innovative uh, techniques. And I know Dan is going to get more into talking about that. But so the shoot seems to have been a happy experience. Um, and it didn't go too far over schedule or over budget. But then the post-production is where things kind of fell apart. Um, as is the case with every one of Wells's Hollywood films after Citizen Kane. They all wound up being cut by the studios in ways that or altered by the studios in ways that he didn't like or approve of. Um, but he had this habit of leaving before the projects were finished. Um, and in this case, he went off to Mexico. He, you know, he went to New York. He sort of wasn't there at the crucial moment to keep control over the cutting of the film. And so the studio recut the film. Um, the, this, if we, we wanna get into talking about the, the three different versions, they recut the film and they cut so much that they left sort of big gaps in the, in the story and then they had to shoot new material and very much against Wells' wishes, they brought in a different director, Harry Keller, who shot some scenes. Wells then wrote this 58-page memo 
objecting to this. This this was the preview version. It's 103 minutes. Um, he broke down all of the things that he objected to about the way they had uh, kind of changed his editing, which was based on cutting back and forth between the different stories. Um, they had changed, you know, sort of messed up his sound design, but he he lays it all out really clearly and kind of explained why he had done things the way he had done and how he felt this actually served the narrative. Um, and the studio did, in fact, take many of his, they, they did take much of his advice. They restored some of the cuts. They wound up not using many of these sort of newly shot scenes, although there are still some, there's still some material in the film that Wells did not shoot. Um, and that became then the 93 minute release version. The film was not successful. The studio did very little to promote it. They actually released it as, on this sort of B half of a double bill. Um, it kind of, you know, sank without a trace. Then in 1998, um, well, first of all, in the 70s, as you right. said, that's, that's the where pre I was going to interject. The preview version was rediscovered, and people initially kind of mistakenly thought, oh, this is the original, this is Wells' original version. And they were calling it the director's cut. No, in fact, it was the version furthest from what Wells wanted. It was the version he had had been complaining about in this famous 58-page memo. Eventually, you know, the idea came to um, this man named Rick Schmidlin that they had this memo and they could use it to try to do as much as possible to restore the film to the way that Wells had wanted it. And he worked with Jonathan Rosenbaum, the film critic, and they they did not have any of the cut footage. I mean, there was nothing they could restore. So the footage is the same, largely, but they tried to restore some of his edits the way he had wanted them, some of this, the sound design. One of the famous things is, um, that the studio had put the credits over the opening tracking shot and they had added the music, the Harry Mancini music. And that was not what Wells had wanted. He had wanted the tracking shot, you know, to be fully seen and to have this kind of diegetic sound score of sort of competing, different types of competing music. So things like that they could restore. Um, and so that became this this reconstructed version. It is also not, a, you know, we will never have Wells's original version, but it, it it's it's the sort of closest we can get at this point to. I think, the I think way that's Wells a very important it. point for everybody to understand that what we're seeing right now. And I think this, you know, I had not seen this 1998 version in, in I guess 25 years now, and I remember being very impressed at the time that it really seemed to just pop in the theater in the way that the film had never done before. And I think that has to do with the the picture restoration and, and I guess a, a full remix that was performed by the legendary sound guy, uh, Walter Murch, who's responsible for Apocalypse yes. Now and many other famous, The Conversation, many other famous soundtracks. Uh, and, and a guy that I once met at Universal named Bob O'Neill was one of these veteran, you know, the guy in charge of restoring or maintaining the Universal Library. And he was of a generation uh, where people referred to every movie as the show. He said, well, we took the show, we did this X, Y, Z and the, show sat on the shelf for 20 years or that kind of thing. But lo and behold, the result was seemingly amazing. Well, and apparently both Janet Lee and Charlton Heston, when they saw this reconstruction, were really thrilled with it and said that they felt that it captured more of the original version of what and of what they felt were Wells' intentions. I mean, he was very interested in this kind of idea of, of contrapuntal editing and of and of using editing to create a certain rhythm and of what he was trying to do by cutting back and forth between the various uh, narratives. And, you know, I think the studio thought people would be confused or something. They just were looking for something more conventional. Um, and Wells also said, you know, that they had cut some of the more sort of far out black comedy with Akeem Tamirov and with Dennis Weaver, who plays the night man. You know, some of this stuff was just a little too far out. For, I don't think there's uh, any shortage of Dennis Weaver in the current version. <laughs> No, although apparently there was originally even more. I mean, Wells just loved Dennis Weaver and loved this performance that he gives. And Harry Mancini's famous theme, I, I will never get it out of my head because we're not going to hear it anymore. Future generations, except I think we hear, we hear it briefly 
when Akeem Tamarov turns on the radio or something yeah. in her room, but you know, that da 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 da, which goes on throughout the three and a half minute tracking shot, which I'm sure Dan is going to tell us about shortly, but that's, that's, that's only lodged in the brains of certain people like myself for the, for the most part, maybe on soundtrack albums. So, so, how, so how do you feel about it yourself at this point in terms of, uh, uh, is, is this, is this the, sort of the best possible version of Touch of Evil or, or is, there, are there, is there things that perhaps don't work? I, I, I mean, I think so. I know there, there are people who defend the original release version. I think as maybe they, they feel that it's the narrative is cleaner or it's, you know, it, it, it has its champions. I, I mean, for me, because of when I discovered the film, the reconstructed version is the version that I saw first and uh -huh. that I got to know. And so to me, it, this is just the way I always have known the film. And it does feel to me the most Wellsian. Um, and, and, you know, with Wells, sometimes a kind of disorientation, for instance, in his very fragmentary discontinuous use of space is the point. And so, you know, trying to give it some kind of more streamlined form seems obviously to be working against what it is he's doing. Um, and I mean, I just, I love the film. There's an enormous amount of things we can talk about, which maybe we'll yes. come back and talk about after it. Yeah. But I guess just before we leave this this subject, uh, to re to reiterate to the, to our viewers, there's no but no major rearranging of footage or edit, editing of, of of any of his material. What we see is still a, is still essentially the chronology of the film as it uh, you know as, as it existed at least in his in his shooting script. Yes. Yes. Now we well, now something you raised it's very interesting to me. Among of course there's, there's innumerable subjects, but. Or Orson Welles' whole uh, views and relationship about the police in America. There's a, there's another fascinating series yes. called the Orson Welles Sketchbook, where he does four or five 15 minute disquisitions on topics, one of which is police brutality in America in the early 1950s. So um, this, he had a long history with this. Um, and a lot of the lines that he gives to Vargas, you know, about who is the boss, the cop or the law. And, you know, a policeman's job is only easy in a police state are really drawn almost directly from this monologue that Wells had give, delivered in 1955, as you mentioned on this TV show. But it actually, it's a show in which he's talking about the case of Isaac Woodard, who was a black veteran who in 1946 was... Yeah dragged off of a bus in um, South Carolina by the police um, for, I don't know what, some very minor thing or nothing at all, and was beaten so severely that he was permanently blinded. And Wells took up this case at the time in, and used his radio program to call for an investigation, to call for the people involved to be held accountable. There was, in fact, a trial. They were acquitted by an all-white jury. But year, you know, years later in 1955, he returns to this case and he retells this story. And this, in this monologue, he says, I'm willing to admit that the policeman has a difficult job, but it's the essence of our society that the policeman's job should be hard. He's there to protect the free citizen. And he says, I'm grateful to the policeman for protecting my home, but I am even more grateful for the laws that protect me from the policeman. And so these are obviously his own views that he's giving to Vargas and Quinlan, who has this idea that, you know, he is the law and that his intuition and everything is, is, is more valuable than these, you know, this rule book. This is everything Wells hated, you know, and so Wells is playing really, you know, what he saw as a great evil, the, the corrupt, the, you know, the corrupt police, the, the policeman who is just kind of in love with his own power. So, you know, I think it's very important to know that and to know that Wells also had a long history, you know, with the civil rights movement and being a, a supporter of, of racial justice in this and, country. And yet, and yet, Imogen, he adds some ambiguity at the very end of Touch of Evil to this in the, in the fact that Quinlan turns out this to be is, right about Sanchez. This is interesting though, does he? 
I mean, everybody always says that, but there's this one line where Schwartz says, oh, well, Sanchez confessed. So it turns out Quinlan was right after all. But I've always thought, why should we not think that Sanchez has confessed because he was beaten into it? I mean, we have seen repeatedly that the police are, in fact, physically abusing him. And so I find it very interesting that most people who see this film have taken that view that, oh, it's there's an interesting ambiguity at the end because he turns out to be right. But I'm not particularly persuaded that we necessarily know he is right. Um, last time we see Sanchez, the, he's, see, he's seemingly in the, in the background of a shot in an interrogation room or something. Exactly. You know, looking too good. Exactly. And so we don't actually ever have any evidence other than Schwartz just saying, well, he's confessed. After and, you know, there is also the scene, you know, the earlier scene in his apartment where off screen we hear that he's being you know roughed up by the police. So right. I don't know. To me, it's it's more ambiguous than that. And I think it's a really interesting question because some people have read it that Quinlan is supposed to be this kind of ambiguous character who perhaps is right, even though his methods are wrong. I don't know. To me, I see him more or as, as a totally corrupt character. And I mean, but it'll be interesting maybe to- He could have been the sheriff of that South Carolina thought. town or something. Yeah, exactly. exactly, exactly. Um, and obviously, I mean, the setting of the film is really interesting. We can talk about the Mexican border and the whole kind of theme of borders in this film. It also brings in some themes that run throughout Wells's work around his fascination with kind of old age and this kind of state of regret and nostalgia that you particularly get in the scenes in uh, Tanya's place, um, his fascination with themes of betrayal. And then it's also interesting to think about this film that has often been called the, the last classic film noir. And it's, you know, I don't think it's maybe technically is, but there's definitely some way in which it functions as a kind of culmination of the noir cycle. So um, these are all things maybe for us to discuss. Mm -hmm. Well, usually at this time, about the half hour mark, yes. we, we bring Dan Cahill in. That's why I there. was just planting those seeds. And, and Dan, and this, is, this is, is, is as much of a, of a feast for you, I think, as any, any of these programs you've been on. As I've said to some of my friends, you could take almost any frame of this film and do a long talking sequence about it, but we're not going to do that today. Instead, I'm going to plunge into my PowerPoint. And this is the title card, as I always begin with. And next, before I go into too much detail, this is a picture of Russell Meddy, ASC, who photographed the film for Wells. Um, he also had shot The Stranger for Orson Wells years before. Um, Metty is widely regarded as, a, as a, one of the pantheon of cameramen. Uh, he eventually uh, shot Spartacus and many other important films, but I think he will be best remembered as the man who shot Touch of Evil because the look is so striking. Here we go with the beginning. This is uh, a few seconds into the long four minute tracking shot, which establishes so much of the movie. I wanna point out one detail. This was intended to be a night shoot and you can see on the horizon that dawn is breaking. And this had to be the last take that they were making of it after the guys planted the bomb here. Um, one of the reasons why the takes kept having to be redone was the gentleman on the right, the actor who plays the customs official or border guard, who allegedly kept blowing his lines, of course, in the last few minutes of the take. And finally, Wells just told him to move his lips and they would dub his dialogue later. So that's the, the story behind all these uh, takes. But um, this basically establishes the environment of a border town and the relationship between Vargas and his newlywed wife. And we get an inkling of who might be in the car that gets blown up shortly. Um, this is as after the car has exploded. I want to note the actress in the foreground here who plays Lenniker's daughter, Marcia. We see her later in the film, too. She is apparently the lover of Sanchez. The actress is Joanna Moore. 
and she did not have a happy life. She had a big problem with substance abuse, but she is also known for having been married to Tatum. O Sorry, I blew it. She's the mother of Tatum O'Neill. She is the, at one time was the wife of her father, Ryan O'Neill. And there, you can see some resemblance there between her and her daughter. Here is the introduction of Orson Welles as Hank Quinlan. Note how the low camera angle, which there are a, a zillion low camera angles in this film, but this emphasizes the worst aspects of Hank Quinlan, namely his bulk um, and his sort of powerful stance throughout the film. I love this moment here where Janet Lee is standing up to Akeem Tamirov as the gangster Grandi. Um, she's not impressed by a cigar in her face. Um, I think we come to really like Susie's character. She takes no guff. And I think this is one of Janet Lee's very best performances. I'm quite taken with her in the film. I had to show you this shot of the strip club advertising 20 sizzling strippers. Uh, one of them, in a few moments, you're going to see actually has her picture sizzled. Um, here we have Charlton Heston as Vargas being followed by a man with acid in a bottle, which he is going to try and throw at Mr. Vargas. This is the result of the, the poster uh, advertising Zeta, the new stripper at the club, um, is, the, is what gets hit with the acid and destroyed. So she was a sizzling stripper in more ways than one. Um, I just have to point out this actress who has one line of dialogue in a very brief scene is Zsa, Zsa Gabor, known sort of as an entertainer rather than a very serious actress. Uh, she did have a good role in um, John Huston's, now I'm forgetting the title, um, the one about uh, Paris um, and Toulouse-Lautrec. It'll come to me in a moment, but uh, I, I venture to say that most people under 30 probably would not know who Zsa, Zsa Gabor was. Here we have Marlena Dietrich, who, in my humble opinion, never looked better than in this film. Wells wanted her in the getup that she did for Golden Earrings, a film from the 40s. And she always looks great with smoke coming out of her face. She's quite a character in this film. Here we have Quinlan, again, another low angle shot, which allows us to see not only the oil derrick in the background, uh, which was a, a feature of Venice, California, where they filmed a lot of it. But uh, we see a wind machine at work blowing that tree around, which doesn't read very well in a still frame. Um, here are more derricks, uh, once again, filmed so that you can see them against the faint light in the sky. Good old Janet Lee manages to throw the light bulb right across the street into the open window where the peeping Tom has been. Good on you, Janet. And this sort of is another example of windows playing a role in the film. She is frequently framed in a window, and so are other characters. This uh, I learned from one of the audio commentaries on the new KL release of the film. This was actually filmed on the studio lot. Uh, it was part of the Universal Street scenes. They used it, um, once again, mimicking the early dawn sky. This is one of the many driving scenes in the film. And this is one of the scenes that was reshot, not reshot, was shot anew by Harry Keller. The studio wanted more information going to the audience about this couple and their relationship. The driving scene here is done with rear projection. This is not the actual backdrop. It, this, the car was in the studio and they had scenery going by in the background. But this is real driving. This is Grandy driving as he's following somebody. Um, so uh, this is how much more real it looks. And I love the fact that his rug is about to blow off. A wonderful little touch. This is the perhaps too cute introduction of the night man, Dennis Weaver, uh, once again, viewed through a window. Um, Wells 
as we heard, really adored Dennis Weaver and loved the idea of casting him in this really nutty role. Um, I'm just looking at the display of not just four, but there are actually five faces in this film. It's unclear who the guy on the right is. I suspect he was just driving the car, but uh, Wells loved to pack a frame with as much information as he could. Here we have Joanna Moore again. Uh, this is another long tracking shot. I think it's longer than the one at the beginning. This is in the apartment of Sanchez, the man on the right, whom she has been living with. And what I think is interesting about this scene is as long as it runs, it goes through the apartment. This was a set, by the way, not an actual location. Uh, it follows uh, Vargas into the bathroom where he discovers the empty shoe box that he has accidentally knocked into the bathtub. And the audience gets a good close look at it. Um, here we see Wells a few moments later. This is a line from him. Didn't you bring me any donuts? No sweet rolls? This is also part of making Hank Quinlan pathetic. Uh, there is another line later in the film where someone says, well, let's go have a drink together. And Wells delivers in a very tortured way the line, I don't drink, which is not true by the end of the film. Here we have Vargas calling his wife at the Mirador Motel. Um, I just cited this because Wells knows how to use an empty background. He filled it with Menzies and Grandy going into the Sanchez apartment, which is in the deep background, and that will lead into the next scene. Uh, I couldn't pass up the shot of the blind lady in the store where Vargas is making his call. Her face is memorable and rather haunting, even though she only has one line of dialogue. Again, a lot of people with one line. Here is the moment in a subsequent scene where Hank Quinlan shows Vargas the dynamite that he claims was in the shoebox all the time, and Vargas is about to dispute that. This is an example, and we'll see another one coming up soon, of how Wells uses off-screen space. We know that Wells is in the back room beating up Sanchez. Now we learn that he had been in the back room in the bathroom planting the dynamite, and this all happens sort of magically, but we realize later, oh yeah, that's how it happened. It's worth noting that Orson Welles was a conjurer, a magician, and he loved to distract you, as most mag mag magicians do, from how the trick was actually done. I love the shadow of Quinlan's cane on Vargas's face. He's about to hit him with it and hesitates, and we see the shadow lingering on Heston's face. Here is one of those window shots. This is coming out of the Sanchez apartment scene. This is Menzies, the Sancho Panza to Hank Quinlan, who has been loyal to him and is now having doubts as he watch, watches Quinlan and Grande walk across the street. This cuts to Susie in the motel, realizing it's dawn and she still hasn't slept yet. Here is the other driving scene that is so real, it's almost a little scary. This is in a street in Venice called Speedway. It's basically like a long alley that, that cuts across the town. And Heston is driving for real. And it looks like he's really speeding quite a bit. It's a very dynamic shot that is basically just a dialogue scene between him and Schwartz. This is the other example of Wells using off-screen space. There are three guys who get on the elevator, and this is after the elevator goes up. Heston takes the stairs and meets the elevator on the second floor. Uh, it's a clever idea, and once again, we, we are following what happens in the off-screen space of Heston climbing the stairs. Another great location, I believe this was a record room at the studio, which suits Wells' interest in deep focus and it's just a great framing for what these guys are doing in the foreground, looking through old files. Here we go, another noted actress with one line of dialogue. This is Mercedes McCambridge, looking unlike you have ever seen her before. 
Uh, her hair was different, makeup, and she wants to watch. That's the only line of dialogue she has, but she is chilling and very menacing. Quinlan, after he has murdered Grandy, taking one last look through the door of this room and uh, the sign on the door, which will be revealed, says, forgot anything? Well, indeed, he has forgotten something very important. We will see that later. And here it is. Menzies is showing Vargas the cane that Quinlan left behind in the murder room, along with Grandy's corpse. And we can see the change in Menzies' attitude towards his boss. We can read it on his face there at the bottom in the background. And here we see it even once more in one of the final concluding scenes. Um, Menzies is basically made the decision to turn on Quinlan, that he's been used and exploited enough. And Joseph Kaya, the actor here, who was born in Malta, believe it or not, um, turns in a terrific performance. His character is actually sort of the linchpin in the plot. It's him turning against Quinlan that changes things in the story. And here we have Marlena delivering her. He was some kind of a man. What does it what does it matter what you say about people? One of the great closing lines of any film. And here we see her going off into the night, into the wilderness of oil derricks. And that concludes my presentation, folks. So come back and let's talk about some more stuff. Okay. I think we're back. Yeah. So we'll take we'll take questions from uh, folks in a few minutes as well. I guess something I was thinking about, and, and, and Imogen, I'm sure you have thoughts about this too. If, if you're gonna introduce young people or audi just audiences in general who, who don't know who Orson Welles is, aren't familiar with him, obviously it seems to me Citizen Kane is the place to start, but maybe Touch of Evil was like second place in terms of really impressing people with the, the visual dyna dynamism, the, the, the complexity of the characters, the uh, uh, taking of a fairly threadbare genre and, and making it much richer than it, than it typically is. But what do you think? I would agree with that. Um, I, I think it's, it's almost a showpiece for Wells' sense of visual expression. Uh, not that Citizen Kane wasn't, but this is him, how many years later, 17 years later, um, showing what he's learned. Imogen, your thoughts? I agree. I have taught this film to students, and it, it, it does kind of blow people's minds with a lot of the things that he does. I mean, one of the things I was thinking about also as I was listening to you, your presentation is that it's a little difficult for people now to realize how difficult the things were that he was doing. I mean, for instance, shooting in the elevator, the idea of that was actually a real elevator in a real building. They had, you know, they did not have like handheld cameras that you could easily just step into the elevator and, and shoot there. But this idea he had of wanting to do it as a continuous shot and wanting to do it in a real place actually was really hard. People did not shoot driving scenes that way. They shot them with back projection because it was, you know, they had to jerry-rig this whole thing with a platform for the camera so that they could shoot those scenes of driving. The crane shots, they're really difficult. But I feel like with filmmakers today, everything is so easy. I mean, I'm sure if there are any filmmakers among you, though, they might dispute that. But I mean, we have drones and, all, and, and handheld cameras and all these things that can make those types of effects really effortless. Or, or, or easier to achieve. And yet, because it was so difficult to do these things back then, you had to have a real reason for them. And so as sort of much of a showpiece as this film is, I feel like there's nothing in it where Wells is just showing off or it's just a flourish of style for no reason. There's always a reason that has to do with the narrative, with the characters, with the themes. Everything is really there for a purpose. And it's so filled with wonderful little moments. I mean, the whole business with the cane that you highlighted and how that cane is established and then ultimately plays this role in revealing, you know, in changing Menzies' mind. Well, supposedly he has this cane because he stopped a bullet for Menzies. And so it also, 
brings in this theme of what a big deal it is for Menzies to turn on Quinlan, whom he had so hero worshipped and whom he apparently, you know, owes this debt to. So things like that. I mean, it's just packed with all these little things that are so rich when you actually, uh, you know, look at it. And every time you look at the film, you see more of these things. And it's, it's, it's so visually stunning, but yeah, it's all that you, you can read something in every frame of this film. There are no disconnected scenes here. Everything connects to something else through a character or an incident. And it's so well thought out. Um, before we go to Q&A, I would like to take a minute or two to read some remarks on Touch of Evil from David Thompson, who is one of my favorite film writers. He wrote well, if I could just brief, just quickly interrupt you on that, because I meant to say this earlier. When I saw the second iteration of the film in the mid 70s, the so-called preview cut, uh, I had just graduated from college and I saw the film with David Thompson, the very gifted British critic who happened to be in Boston at the time uh, as, a, as a film critic for one of the weekly newspapers. And I think I learned more in one afternoon than I had at any point about movies up to that time in my life. And, and we were saying, I'm saying at the time, this was in 1977, that this was probably going to be the definitive version of Touch of Evil. Well, yeah, okay. Don't count your chickens. All right. This is from Thompson's book, Rosebud, a book about Orson Welles. And I want to note that this, these two paragraphs I'm going to read were <clears throat> published in 1996 before any of us saw the reconstructed version. Touch of Evil is a continuous and consistent stylistic reverie on claustrophobia and corruption. The movie is a melodrama, and in many of the settings, the sordidness is fondly piled on. For example, the motel, the canal finale, and a real flop house for the last murder, a place so ugly that Janet Lee needed a guard. But Wells was working again with a confidence, a zeal, and an absolute integrity of style and meaning that is cinema. Nothing in the film, finally, is large and human enough for its stylistic wealth. So the beauty goes as crystalline and detachable as dry paint. It is as if Wells was lamenting that there can hardly be any more great films. The trick of doing it has taken over. The magic has turned sour. And so Touch of Evil is some kind of masterpiece and an offense in the nostrils of the public. Wells had shut the door on himself. He would never direct another film in Hollywood. He had dropped his cane, spelled K-A-N-E, at the scene of the crime and successfully abandoned the kind of future, the kind of American future he only half wanted. Now, I'm not sure I agree with everything he says, but I just like the way he says it. And I think there's a lot in there that you can think about as far as this being the last of an era of film noir. Yes. I mean, I, I brought that idea up earlier. I mean, that was something, you know, Paul Schrader said in his very important notes on film noir in 1972. Um, and even though, as I say, I think there are certainly films that come after this that you can also see as being sort of late, very late period film noir. This, this is like, it's like film noir has entered this kind of Baroque and decadent phase, um, which maybe starts with Kiss Me Deadly. And, you know, there's something about that sense of sort of decay in this film. But it's also about the way that he is playing with all of these genre elements and you, you know you have these lines like where Janet Lee says you've been watching too many gangster movies to to Grandy you know it's like he he's he's working with this form this you know I, I don't think noir is a genre but you know he's working with this style that's become very well known and he's he's playing with you know has sort of how far he can go with a lot of these things and with subverting some of the tropes and with kind of pushing other tropes to extremes and the whole thing has this sense of of both you know this this kind of turning it into black comedy but also this real sort of elegiac feeling at times and my favorite line in the movie and what i think is the classic noir line is when tanya says your future is all used up and that that's yeah. that's him. It's like she's making this comment on this whole sort of form of of cinema, as well as on the character of Quinlan. You know, it's interesting that you sort of linked it to Kiss Me Deadly, um, because one factor that we ought to consider here is that by the late 1950s, there were cracks forming in the production code. 
And for example, the scene in the trailer where, where there, it looks like they're going to gang rape Susie in the motel. I don't think that would have passed muster uh, 10 years prior. Uh, it would have been too much for the faint hearts in the production code office. But um, there are there are other trends at work that make this seem very decadent here. Okay, guys, I think it's time for questions. Thank you so much. I'm going to start because I am uh, the Zoom host. Could you tell us uh, uh, where in their career, besides Orson Welles, were the other actors? Well, Heston was in the middle of a big run of huge box office successes. Uh, he had been in the Ten Commandments for DeMille, and soon coming very soon would be the epic Ben-Hur. Uh, Heston was noted for being a very physical actor. I think he did most of the chariot race stunts in Ben-Hur. Um, and he apparently did a lot of the fight scene dynamics in Touch of Evil. Um, I, I will comment about Heston that the end of his career did not end well as far as his public image was. He got too political with the Second Amendment, and a lot of people kind of turned off to him, as I did. But watching Touch of Evil and hearing his commentary, it sort of rehabilitated his image in my mind. Uh, I, I'm thinking he was actually not a bad actor after all. Janet Lee, um, talking about cinematographers here, um, the camera operator on Touch of Evil was a guy named John Russell. He was operating the camera for Russell Meddy. And John Russell went on to do a lot of work with Hitchcock, in particular on the TV series. And he became the director of photography on a little film called Psycho that also featured Janet Lee, who I would like to think took some comfort in the midst of the horrors of that film at having a familiar face on the crew, someone that she could respond to. Um, go ahead, somebody else? <laughs> No, the well, rest I, I, I just uh, uh, thinking of Janet Lee and those two films. I mean, you know, you would think she would know better than to check into a, mo a motel again after that <laughs> evil. <laughs> uh, nothing good ever happens to Janet Lee in a motel. Um, I will just add that you know, so they had these two big star, big Hollywood stars, Janet Lee and and Charlton Heston, but. Much of the rest of the cast was chosen by Wells. Many of them were his friends and people that he had used in many of his, in some of his other films, like Akeem Tamirov. Um, you know, he had the idea of creating this character for Marlena Dietrich, who was also an old friend of his. They shot that in one night. Same with Mercedes McCambridge. Part of the reason, I think, why there are all these wonderful people who appear just briefly is that these were really you know, friends of his and just actors that he loved that he wanted to create these characters for. So it's, there's kind of a split between, you know, the Hollywood couple and then all of these kind of grotesque uh, and this wonderful kind of multinational cast of character actors that Wells brought in himself. Uh, uh, Imogen, and was Orson Welles that size or was that makeup? It's... Uh, a bit of both. No, he, he's wearing a lot of padding and makeup. He had not gotten to quite that size yet, although he yeah. kind of yeah, not, got not pretty close by the end of his life. Quite yet. Yeah. Okay. Sheila, do you want to unmute and uh, open your video, please? Hi, Sheila. Hi. Um, I just want to say I thought this was a terrible movie. Um, it was so illogical. And it, it just kind of disappointed me because you you kept various people kept referring to it as a great film noir. And I thought it was the most illogical movie I've ever seen. If I had been in a theater, I think I would have walked out on it. I mean, starting at the very beginning of the movie where Janet Lee, um, Charlton Heston goes to investigate the uh, exploded car. And Janet Lee goes off with some hoodlums, doesn't tell her husband where she's going, just goes. I mean, it's kind of a stupid thing for the wife of a lawman to do. That was just the first thing. Um, and there were so many scenes like that, like um, um, Orson Welles leaves his cane at the murder scene. If any of you have ever walked with a cane, which I have when I had my knee done, 
you don't just walk away and leave your cane. And there's there's a a, a scene well, where he's pretty drunk and maybe feeling no pain at that point. Uh, well, I mean, you see him walk. He's, he weighs like eight hundred pounds. He's dragging a foot. He's limping, and he walked out of the murder scene without his cane. So anyway, I just you know it's, it's it, it occurs to me that a lot of times we watch movies, watch good movies. And we see a scene and we think, wait a minute, that doesn't make a lot of sense. Somebody's wearing something or they're eating something or they're accusing somebody. And you think, wait a minute, this doesn't make sense. But I have to say, I thought this movie was so illogical. Um, it, it, and it was, it was sad to me because there's so many brilliant film noir movies that we could have watched. I really think this was awful. And you you mentioned the production code. In the scene where Janet Lee is kidnapped and then they drug her and then they take her clothes off and they leave and they leave her to be found. They make a point that the hoodlums who kidnapped her, their girlfriends came along and the girlfriends undressed her, which seemed very unlikely to me. I mean, I was surprised she wasn't raped. I, I mean, it seems to me that was a, a concession to the to the morals code that, oh, the girlfriends undressed her. Anyway, there were just a lot of scenes in this movie, and I thought, what what the hell is going on here? So just one person's opinion. Well, there was a, there seemed to be a suggestion that those girlfriends were not heterosexual either. But that, to me, that adds some perversity to it. But And they were all supposed to be on drugs at that time point. I mean, all those hoodlums had been smoking reefer or something worse. So um, that, that maybe explains some of their behavior. But thank you for your opinion, Sheila. Thank you, Sheila. You're welcome. Lou, do you want to unmute and start your uh, video, please? Hi, Lou. Hi, Lou. You're muted. There we go. Um, I'm just curious to know if anybody wants to comment about the fact that the hoodlums threaten Janet Lee's character a lot with all sorts of harm and, and terrible things, but what they actually do to her is very minimal. Um, she stands up to Akeem Timuroff in the, in the scene in the office. Uh, she's not raped. They don't inject her with narcotics. It's with sodium pentothal instead. Um, what's the point of them not doing what they threatened they were going to do. Well, the idea is that the whole thing is a, just a frame. It's they're trying to get at Vargas, really. And so they're just, they're, they do this frame to set her up. I mean, I guess this is sort of a response to, to Sheila's comment. I mean, I guess if you watch the film expecting realism or, you, you know everything to be 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 plausible yes indeed many of the things in the film don't perhaps make a lot of sense um but there's all this kind of uh the the idea of framing is so much of a theme throughout the movie you know because there was the question of whether sanchez has been framed you know that and the whole thing has this very theatrical quality. I mean, it's like they terrorize her, but then supposedly they didn't really do anything to her. Um, it is a it is a strange thing. And I mean, I guess it's a question whether or not it's the production code had, any, had anything to do with that. Um, well, I think it's worth but, noting, again, Imogen, your, your statement that they were basically trying to frame her. And when... Heston is reunited with her. She's being held for murder in a jail cell. So right. they so it's accomplished not... some of what they were trying to do. I mean, I think question... Timiroff says, go ahead, Imogen. Oh, I was just going to say, I mean, the question of, of sort of why Quinlan kills Grandy is also a bit mysterious. Why he, choose, why he chooses to do that. And that's then what she is, is being framed for. Um, and he chooses to strangle him, which ostensibly is the way that his own wife had been killed. And that, you know, so again, it's like you have to you have to be watching it 
with this kind of different eye that is more about the sort of themes and the way that that this that the they're being expressed through these perhaps not you know i mean the whole thing is so flamboyant and so stylized i think you you have to just kind of go <laughs> go along with it i guess sorry you, what were you saying gary well, I think that uh, Tamirov at one point says to Wells, well, I could tell a story about you, Captain Quinlan. So he's yes, obviously, he's, he's Grandy knows him out of the way. something about him. But there's also this, I've always had the sense, perhaps, that just the idea of getting away with murder is kind of like the ultimate show of his own power and, I, and, and of his corruption. I agree. Thank you. Thank you, Lou. Uh, Max wants uh, has raised his hand. So Max, Max, yes, there he is. Intimidating! What a wonderful conversation between you three. And Imogen, thank you so much for being a part of this. One, first of all, I think many of us lovers of noir understand that you don't always look for logic in a lot of the narratives. So many of the films are based on coincidence, crazy coincidence and not always logical behavior. That's just commonplace in a, in a noir narrative. Dan, when you were talking about one scene in the film where I believe acid is being thrown against a wall, yeah. the poster Zeta, if I'm not mistaken, Zeta I, I was the young woman say. blown up in the car in the beginning. Yes, yes, played by Joy Lansing, who was sort of a blonde bombshell in a lot of film and TV in that era. And Wells even cast her in the Fountain of Youth uh, story that he did. It, it's a very nasty joke. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. It really <laughs> I mean, is. The destruction of the poster is very nasty. And the sizzling strippers is a nasty joke, given that she has just been blown up. There was a fascinating essay from the BFI by Richard Denning. I'm sure many of you are familiar. Yes, with that's a great very, essay. Very, very compelling. And he says, in a way, the Zeta character is assassinated twice or she's killed twice in the car bomb and then by the throwing of the acid. Uh, Imogen, I'd be very interested in your thoughts. Deming is suggesting compellingly in his art, in his book that the Vargas character, he's pretty passive aggressive. He puts on this, this noble detective act, but he's kind of working the, the, he's kind of manipulating things and kind of going outside of law of the law a little bit and maybe looking askance at times when he shouldn't be, especially in the treatment of Sanchez. Do you have any thoughts on Vargas? Well, is he playing is he simply certainly. a handsome version of Quinlan? Certainly by the end, I think you're meant to see that he also resorts to kind of extra legal means and the whole idea of the, the you know, the, the audio recording as a way of getting, you know, Quinlan's confession is obviously a kind of underhanded method. Um, yes, I mean, I think Wells is, is is obviously interested in some moral ambiguity and the ambiguity of both of these characters. I mean, I don't think I would not go so far as to say that there's nothing to choose between them, certainly. But I don't you know, I think that and Wells actually specifically said that he tried to make this character of Vargas more interesting, that the character he felt as originally conceived in the in the script was too much of a just one dimensional, you know, boring hero and so i think maybe giving him these moments you know the moment where he he just sort of loses it and beats up the guy in the bar or you know the sort of things he does at the end are meant to make him a more interesting character by suggesting that he also is not so morally pure um I did see, I, you know, we have, there was a question in the chat about why did they, why did they use brown face instead of using real Mexican actors? I mean, I, I wish there was a good answer for that. I mean, the answer is they wanted to cast Charles Heston because he was such a huge star at this time. Um, but it was I have always it. thought it was a shame it was not, um, you know, Ricardo Montalban or somebody like that. I do think it was but, a brilliant gesture on Wells' part to direct Heston not to try and yes. fake Mexican accent. That would have been a Thank disaster. Thank goodness. Um, yeah. 
So, okay, um, guys, I think we are uh, at the end of our okay. talk back. I would like to, uh, it, it was fascinating. It, I, as I said, it was a difficult thing to see because it's, vi it's, it's violent. Yes. And, and uh, the corruption is really difficult to, uh, but I understand why you say it's a real film noir. <laughs> this is film noir. So it's this uh, exaggeration in a way. Uh, Dark world. Thank you. Uh, yeah. Two, thank two you. other quick things. Sorry, sorry, Marianne. Two other quick things. I found the title of the film that Zsa, Zsa made with John Huston, Moulin Rouge. Very famous film. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. She has a wonderful performance. And I just want to say happy Thanksgiving to everybody, my on-screen collaborators and everybody out there in the audience. We have a good holiday coming up. And thank uh, Imogen, you welcome. for joining us. Thank you welcome so much. To the program. Can you can yes. you now can you leave us Imogen with one other film noir perhaps that is underappreciated that we might want to seek out and uh, maybe we haven't seen? Sure. Well, I mean, what I would really love to do is mention that there is a lot of great Mexican film noir from this era. I mean, there are a lot of American film noir that are set either on the border or in Mexico. Uh, there are a lot of great films I could mention, but. Mexico itself had a great tradition of film noir. Unfortunately, many of the films are not easy to see, but Victims of Sin by Emilio yes. Fernandez has finally had both a theatrical release and it will be coming to uh, Blu-ray from the Criterion Collection within the next few months, I believe. Um, it is the commentary truly, by Imogen uh, Smith. Uh, you... No, I did not do a commentary. I've written about the film, though, in the past, but it's a fantastic, it's all set in nightclubs. It stars this fabulous um, Cuban performer named Ninon Sevilla who, who sing, dances, and it's it's a real, it's a kind of cabaret noir melodrama with Can fabulous cinematography by the great Gabriel Figueroa. It's called Victimas del Pecado, Victims of Sin. Victims of Sin. By Directed Emilio by Fernandez. Emilio Fernandez, who was General Mapache in The Wild Bunch. That's how he's, how he's probably best known in America. Thank you again. Thank you, all the audience. Have a happy Thanksgiving, everyone, and hope to see Thanks. you in our next lecture and talk back. Bye. Thanks, everyone. See you next time.